All right, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you all for joining um, this webinar that we had uh, difficulty uh, planning or, or putting it in the schedule. Uh, we know that everyone is busy uh, responding to COVID-19, um, but we want to present uh, to you a particular tool that is developed, uh, which is called the Epidemic Needs Analysis Tool, which is focusing, which focuses on um, estimating the bed capacity and response or search capacity of hospitals uh, within countries uh, to, to COVID-19. Um, we, so, my name is Dr. Rufus Ewing. I'm the advisor for health systems and services here for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean. Okay. Uh, collaborating, collaborating with uh, our, our Power WHO colleagues in the Listen, Washington um, office. Um, and which was Dr. Ronaldo Holder, who, who was one of the persons who was instrumental in developing uh, the tool, as well as um, we have Benjamin Portis, who uh, Dr. Portis is one of the advisor, regional advisor for health systems for HRH for health human resource um, for health, uh, who will be joining us as well. So what we want to do is to share this tool with you and to see how you can use it uh, going forward in your response to COVID, so you can better prepare yourselves. So without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Ronaldo Holder, who will take you through the tool. Um, and then we can have a session where we can ask question and answer session. As I said, this session will be recorded. So for persons who may not, who want to review it or other countries when they come later, they can review uh, this session uh, to learn how to use it. So thank you very much um, for being here. Ronaldo, the holder, um, it's all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Rufus. And uh, let's go right to business. Uh, will you allow me to share the, the screen? Yeah. yeah. All right, let me share screen. I'll share the screen. Allow you to share it. You can share it. You got it, right? Got it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's good. So this this tool was developed with the intention of uh, assisting countries of the Pan American Health Organization, and specifically those units responsible for the res the response to this emergency. <coughs> Sorry, our, our planning units in uh, estimating the the bed cap the current bed capacity to look at the capacity to to search and increase uh, the number of beds available to deal with. Uh, patients suffering from COVID-19, and also to estimate the human resources requirements that would that would be needed to uh, expand that capacity. The tool is is built on a simple Excel uh, Excel worksheet. As you can see below, it has <clears throat> seven sections. Uh, the first section is on the screen. It's uh, the introduction. Each one of these icons are actually active and they will take you to the other worksheets. So the first icon is this instruction is, is the instructions that explain how the, the tool works. And then uh, there are different uh, other sections to look at the, the three different scenarios on which we have based the calculations. Uh, three sheets to actually work scenarios with the, the, the by inputting the data from your specific countries or regions or hospitals. And then the, the three uh, icons in green is for the estimation of human resources required for intermediate admission to hospitals and human re resources required for critical care. Then there's the last uh, <clears throat> sheet that deals with uh, projections that can be done for a country or a region based mostly on, uh, based specifically on total population. <clears throat> so what I try to do is, is to go through each one of these worksheets and uh, provide an explanation of, of what it contains and, and how it works more or less. Uh, after that, uh, <clears throat> we could take some questions, but the, the experience with all the other sessions, uh, training sessions like this, 
what it has uh, showed us is that uh, we do this, the, <clears throat> the training session. It would be good for you to go back to your units and actually input your real data for your country. And then we can have a um, follow up uh, discussion one on one with each one of the, the, the 10 countries, if, it's, if that's a need, to actually look at your data and uh, further the, the, the explanations of the training based on your data and your reality. You wanted to say something, Dr. Ewan? Yes. Um, all right. I'm going to unmute someone because they, they have their hand raised in the room. Uh, I'll unmute them so that they can speak. Um, maybe you may want to share the uh, go, go go over the version of the of the software because in your introdu in your introductory slide the version that was shared with the country which I think was the latest version does not have that introduction introduction page I think that's the only difference so you, you maybe you may want to explain that uh, just in case the version that they have does not have that introduction page. Um, Correct. This this is the latest version. We this is a tool that is is under constant uh, review and uh, <clears throat> we have been improving it based on recommendations from countries. Uh, what you're seeing is, is a most recent version and I will email this to you as soon as we conclude this session so you can distribute it to uh, your countries. And um, <clears throat> what, what the, all these changes that you may see comparing to the, to the, the previous versions come from recommendations of the countries that began using the tool when it was developed. The tool was developed initially in Spanish. Uh, we've been working on different iterations, trying to improve the functioning of the tool and also uh, for the English version, trying to improve the translation. The translation of the initial version was not uh, up to, to standard and uh, we still have some work to do on this one, but uh, <clears throat> as I said, it's work in progress. And we will continue to, to perfect it. And once, and whenever a new version comes out, we'll we'll form and, it. Um, we're not, let me just check my mic again because I think somebody, someone's saying that they're hearing me, um, but I, my mic is uh, on mute. Uh, are you hearing me, Ronaldo? You are. I can hear you perfectly. Um, are you hearing me now, everyone else? If, if you are, you can just raise your hand and indicate that you can hear me. Uh, raise your hand in the Chat, if you can hear me. Uh, this is a red light. I mean, uh, sure. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, right, there's a raise hand button. Okay, Fiona, you can hear me. Good. Uh, I see that. Okay, great. Um, Danny, ra raise your hand and your image if you can, I can see your image. So you just raise your hand and, um, because you wanted to person say you couldn't hear me. Danny, Danny Gill. All right, that's good. I can see you. You can hear me. Thank you. All right, carry on. Um, continue, Ronaldo. My recommendation would be for everyone to silence your mic, and that improves the improves the sound. Okay, <clears throat> okay so let's let's go to the first icon. He's only talking about me, right? Mm -hmm. The icon takes us to yeah. worksheet that contains the instructions. Mm -hmm. An introduction that presents the tool. Can you silence your mic, please? The need, the tool is, is to estimate the needs for uh, hospital beds and particularly for intensive care beds called critical care beds in order to avoid hospital collapsing because of the influx of patients or to allow the a country or a region to plan and in anticipation how the number of beds and the capacity to respond to the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic will progress. Uh, <clears throat> in many cases, the countries begin with what is the established capacity for intensive care, for example, and then uh, with the increase of cases and the influx of new ventilators and uh, new uh, investments made in response capacity, may need to expand the number of intensive care beds, ventilators, etc. And the tool allows you to look at, at how that can be expanded based on different scenarios and calculations. So the analysis can be done for an individual hospital, can be done for a, a network of services that integrates both hospitals and primary care, and it can look and uh, it can be looked for all. It can be done for all services at the country level. You can actually do an assessment of the 
the, the entire country based on <clears throat> and the estimation for all hospitals in that country. The first, uh, uh, the first step is to, uh, is to input the basic data. And that's about the only thing that the users have to do. Uh, so once you receive the tool, the only thing that, the only information that you will have to provide for the tool to work is these six aspects that I'm going to um, explain briefly. The first, uh, first table on your left with the number one has three aspects to it. One, the first is the number of days for analysis, and the recommendation is to do analysis for 30 days a month. Uh, on your right, you'll see the, the explanation for each one of these, uh, of these tables. So the, the, the first uh, data is usually the amount of days for the for the calculation, which is thirty days. Uh, we have been we have been um, also making calculations for ninety days, which is more or less the average length of the of the expansion, the first expansion of the, the epidemic. We have we have used a basic um, average length of stay of twelve days for twelve to fifteen days for patients not requiring ventilatory support. Mechanical ventilatory support. Uh, patients who, are, who need to be admitted to the hospital because of COVID-19 and who requires treatment with oxygen, but that treatment is not provided through a mechanical ventilator. The average uh, length of stay based on the, the experience in Wuhan and even in, 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 in Spain and France is around 12 days for these patients. The average length of stay of patients in intensive care has been calculated around 15 days. And that depends uh, mostly on, on the progression of, of the symptomatology. Most patients begin in intermediate or <clears throat> care and then move on to, to, inten to critical intensive care. So they might be, their, their, their length of stay might be longer. When patients enter and direct into critical care have an average of 15 days. So that's the first um, table that, that information is provided. In number two, what you see there is the averages based on the Wuhan model. In Wuhan, 80% of patients did not require admission to hospitals. Between 14 and 15% of the patients required admission into medium, with medium severity cases that did not require uh, mechanical ventilation, but did require uh, other forms of uh, intensive care treatment and administration of oxygen at higher, higher, higher concentrations. And 5% of the patients required intensive care, critical intensive care admissions with mechanical ventilatory support. So we're using, in this, in this particular example, we're using experience from China. Question number three, uh, is the estimate of the amount of cases of COVID the country expects to see per day. And we'll come back to that in, in, the, in the example when we look at the scenario. It depends on uh, an estimation based on, the, on your total population or uh, other indicators coming, coming out of the previous experiences in other countries of the number of patients that can be expected to require uh, or to demand services in the health services daily for the first and for the first three months. Section four is the inputs the information on human resources. It calculates the number of medical doctors per hour to address the number of beds, number of nurses and the number of nursing assistants. The calculation is based on hours, not persons. Okay. So it's based on hours because the assignment of persons to these shift, to different shifts depend on uh, the protocols in each country. Some countries, nurses in intensive care, and even in, ter in intermediate care uh, may work 12 hours shift, some work six hours shift, some work eight hours shift. 
So this calculation here is based on hours, and then to actually estimate the number of persons, uh, it would have to be converted based on the protocols or the, the, the standards in each country for uh, nurses uh, in intensive care, doctors, nurses, and nursing assistants in intensive care. So the first table deals with patients in intermediate care, the second table deals with patients in critical care, and the number of, and the third table deals with how many patients demand uh, care at the triage facility in the emergency room per hour, and how many patients are seen by a physician in emergency care per hour. We have estimated that a well set up triage uh, operations in the emergency room, we see approximately 10 patients per hour. And the actual uh, first cure of that patient by physicians in, in emergency rooms uh, is about three patients per hour. Table number five deals now with the number of beds. The first and the top level, it deals with the with the uh, normal operational beds of the hospital. In this case, uh, this um, make-believe hospital has operated 366 beds on a normal day, uh, independent of the emergency. And those beds have an occupation uh, per, uh, occupancy rate of 80%. That would give you the amount of beds that would be available for the emergency. And that hospital also has capacity to put into operation 30 additional beds. It has the space, the, the, the equipment, and in some cases, even the human resources to expand the capacity of the hospital by 30 beds. That's what uh, you're, you're seeing in that, in that table. That would give the hospital a total response capacity for COVID of 103 beds. It's the sum of the available beds and the expansion bed capacity would give us the number of beds that would be available for the response because of course the hospital already has a, a occupancy rate of 80% and it's expected to continue to provide services uh, apart from the uh, COVID patients. The second aspect of the table deals with the critical care beds. On a normal basis, that op the hospitals oper operate, that hospital operates 40 critical care beds. And remember that critical care beds are defined by the availability of a mechanical ventilator. It's not a critical bed if, it's not, if you don't have the ventilator. So in this case, critical it, it operates on a normal basis, 40 in, uh, critical intensive care beds at a 80% occupancy rate, that leaves available eight beds. It has also the expansion capacity for 10 more units, 10 more beds, including their ventilators, that will give them a response capacity for COVID of 18 beds. In section number six now is where we begin to build our different scenario alternatives. If you look at section three, you will see that in this example, hospital estimated that they will see 50 cases of COVID <laughs> per day. That number 50 coincides with the last box on this level, which is 50 also. And it works automatically. As soon as you input the number, in number three, the same number would appear here in section six in the last uh, the last last box. The other boxes now, it's at your uh, pleasure to introduce the different levels that you would like to uh, analyze with the tool. These you can input um, on your own. You can decide to look at okay, what would happen if I use turf? 30 beds, what will happen if I do use 25, 21, right down to number, right down to one. But remember that whatever is in this 
box number three will appear automatically in the last section of the analysis table. The other way of making this calculation, and we'll see this more in detail at the end, is by using total population and total capacity for, uh, for, for intensive and critical care uh, countrywide or in a network. And um, I'll come back to this, this section of the tool uh, further in the, in the presentation. So once the basic data is introduced and all these boxes are have data, the tool will give you this aspect, which is automatically calculated based on the information in, in step number one. So it will give you bed requirements. It will give you the estimate of human resources, both doctors, nurses, doctors, nurses, and nursing assistant. It will give you the estimate of patients in emergency care. It dry, draws a graph. And it also gives you an analysis of, based on, on, on this section, in, in section number six of the input area, it will give you an analysis of how your intermediate care beds will support the number of patients that have been estimated. And, uh, these numbers go from one to 60, just as 50 as it was above. And it gives you, using colors, it would give you one. While it's white, it means that your response capacity is above 70%. And well, uh, what you do is monitor the demand and prepare uh, for potential increase of that demand. When it becomes yellow, it means that your response capacity is between 50 and 70%. That's the moment to begin uh, actually putting in place your expansion capacity. If you are already identified that, or to identify the expansion capacity and start to organize it. Once it becomes orange, which is between 30 and 50%, it means that you're coming close to your total capacity and uh, it's necessary to start implementing some other measures to uh, avoid overwhelming the intensive and the critical care capacity and avoid collapsing the, the, the critical care capacity. Once it be, it's in red, now you're, you have, you're in imminent danger of overwhelming your intensive care and critical care capacity. Something has to be done because any additional patients will, re, will re, um, result in collapse of the system. So on, based on this explanation, now I'll go back and we'll see each, all these, each one of these things work in the, in the tool. I'll go first to the tab that says scenario projections. Okay. These scenario projections are based on the three most studied uh, scenarios, international scenarios of the, the, the pandemic up to this moment. Scenario number one is based on Wuhan in China, right? Where they they had uh, their 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 demand was eighty percent of patients did not require inpatient care. Fifteen percent of patients were classified as severe cases and required required intensive care with um, oxygen and uh, support. 5% of patients required critical intensive care with the use of ventilators. That's the Wuhan model. And if you input uh, the information, it brings you this, these calculations. There were, for instance, in this case, there were 300 beds available, in this hospital or, or it could be a, a region, at the occupancy rate of 80%, that left them with 60 beds, 60 of the, of the normal uh, operational beds available for the for COVID. They had the, 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 cap, the capacity to extend 10 beds more and that gave them a total of 70 beds. In intensive care, they, had, they, they, they began with 100 beds, but with a 90% occupancy rate, which left only 10 beds available for COVID-19. They have capacity to extend 10 more beds with ventilators 
and that gave them a, a response capacity for COVID of 20 beds. At the graph below, you see that in regards to general beds, we are plotted here. Uh, see the number 70 that comes that is in this box that says response capacity is also the in this box, this series of boxes here. And in looking at that, if you look at, at the number of cases per day and follow it, you see that at five cases per day, the hospital remains with full capacity for dealing with the demand. Once I get to 10 patients per day, it's down to 68% of its capacity. And uh, planning needs to begin as to how to address the expansion or what measures are going to be put in place so that the beds are not overwhelmed. At 20 patients per day, which, is, which will, lead, will lead to about 600 patients per month, it already indicates that the services are approaching rapidly to a level where it would be unsustainable. 25 patients put them in a red zone, and 30 or 31 patients per day would put them below uh, the capacity and uh, in danger of collapse, of collapsing the, the, the capacity of the bed capacity for the response. But when you look at, at the intensive care beds now, where there's only 20 beds available, as soon as the, the hospital is seeing 10 patients per day with COVID diagnosis, they will be at 50% response capacity will be in the, in the orange zone. And at 15 pa patients, it begins to alarm. The alarm begins to sound. And <clears throat> once they achieve a little bit over 20, it's exactly 22 patients per day, they will be below, they will be in a situation where the service will collapse completely. And that was what was uh, actually the situation in uh, some of the is in, in Wuhan in some of some of the hospitals with this similar configuration. It was, and that explains why there was a need to expand hospi uh, hospitals, to build new hospitals, to command hotels, etc. All those measures were taken based on this type of analysis. Scenario number two now is based on what what was occurring in. Spain and France uh, uh, two weeks, three weeks into the, into the emergency. In their case, 36% of patients required admission to hospitals, 8% required intensive ventilatory care, and uh, patients not re that were treated ambulatory and did not require to be to admitted to hospitals was uh, 56%. We have to take into consideration when we do these analysis, the, the configuration, uh, the demographics of the population in different countries. Okay. Wuhan had a more, um, a, a population with, with, a, with a higher degree of, of younger people. Uh, Spain and France uh, and, and Italy also has a higher percentage of senior citizens, people above 60 years and more. And, and that, that also plays a role in the demand uh, for care. So in, in, in Spain and France, which is scenario number two, this was the configuration and these were the results. As you can see, their capacity from the very beginning was actually threatened and was rapidly overwhelmed. Scenario number three is the scenario in Italy, which has, which has been the extreme, this is the extreme case of, um, of COVID response, uh, that actually most of the hospitals, especially in the north of, of, of Italy, collapsed very early because of the high demand and services. In the north of, of, of Italy, only 44% of patients were able to be treated ambulatory and did not require admission to hospitals. 46% of patients required admission and 10% of patients required intensive care, vent intensive ventilatory care. So those, those percentages are way 
a, a lot higher in, in intensive periods, the double of what uh, was seen in Wuhan. And of course, well, the situation with the same number of beds and the same characteristics, uh, uh, similar characteristics of the Wuhan example, uh, as you can see, most of the capacity was over very early uh, at a lower number of cases per day. So these, taking into account these three scenarios, we can, you can actually plot your information against uh, these calculations. So for that, you use these tabs that says scenario one, two, and three. You choose to use this, the, the Wuhan um, model, then a, you go to, to scenario number one. Each one of these boxes has the explanation, very small uh, letters, but once you have it on your computer, you can actually magnify and look at the definitions on what goes here. If I magnify this, for instance, in table number one, it tells you it's a suggested analysis period, which is 30 days or a month. The average stay for general inpatient care was calculated as 15. These are patients with medium severity, and as a, based on the Wuhan China example. And average stay of critical care was 20 days. Uh, this is with, with this is as to show for intensive care requiring ventilator support. Each one of the, of the boxes has it, its its uh, definition and explanation on the right side of the box. Uh, you can actually input your own data against in, in regards to beds uh, and occupancy rate, and uh, it will do automatically the calculation for available beds. You input the information of what number of beds can be expanded, and that will automatically give you the number of response beds. So those that are gray are mostly um, fields that are, that calculate automatically or that are previously set. For instance, uh, when looking at human resources, they all have 24 hours because they're calculated for one day. So it's the amount of, of physician hours in a day and how many beds uh, that physician uh, is responsible for in, in that time frame. In this case, each physician was responsible for 15 beds a nurse was responsible for 30 beds, and there was a, a nurse. There was a physician for each 15 beds, a nurse for each 30 beds, and a nursing assistant for each 15 bed throughout the 24 hour period. So that allows you now to calculate the number of hours and convert that number of hours into persons based on the, uh, the, the norms. Uh, for work hours in intensive care for your your country, as I said before, some countries do twelve, some do eight, some do six, uh, based on and 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 agreements with with intensive care personnel, and well, that allows you to now calculate how many doctors and nurses and nursing assistants you require to cover the twenty four hours. Again, in this table, the sensitivity is pandemic severity is 18, 15, 20, uh, 5 uh, calculation. Here, you input the, again, as I said, the, the number of beds uh, for intermediate care and the number of beds for critical care, and it gives you uh, what is available. And then <laughs> coming back again to, to section three, in this case, this hospital estimated that there will be seeing 60 COVID patients per day. That 60 coincides with the number 60, this section and this new box that we see here. Okay. These are the numbers 55, 50, 45, 35. You can put at your own discretion. This is to see how it would work with, with, with below the maximum number of beds, how uh, the scenarios will work through with the different amount of uh, beds available. Once the information is put is 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 completed here in the basic data estimations, the rest of the tool will do the calculations. And as you can see, in that blue area, we're asking do not enter data because then the tool will not work. If you change any any one of the boxes below this line, uh, the calculations will will not work. So it gives you once 
the, the basic data is in, it gives you what the requirement for, what is the bed requirements for different scenarios. For your maximum number, which is 60, and for the other um, scenarios that you have established in a decreasing number. For example, for 30 beds, you would need, for 30 cases per day, sorry, you would need 65.5, and we always round up to the, to the higher number, 68, in patients days, uh, in patient beds per day. In the case of ICU, you would need 30, at, at 30 um, cases per day, you would need availability of 30 beds, okay? And those intensive care beds can be uh, further divided into ICU beds, which is usually those we manage with ventilators, and step down beds, which is those that are managed uh, with ventilatory support, uh, oxygen support, sorry. It gives you also the estimation of the human resources based on the total monthly hours. It allows you then to, to make your conversions, as explained before. It gives you the graph and it gives you also the, the analysis based on the number of cases and the number of beds, what would be the behavior of the admissions and when uh, the, that number of beds will become insufficient and the system will collapse, as explained in the previous explanation. Based on this, again, this, the color coding is there. And uh, it also actually shows you a progression by week of what to expect uh, in number of mild cases, severe cases, and critical care cases during, during the, process, the, the, the progression of the first curve, of the curve itself, based on the same numbers that you have established for the analysis, beginning with the maximum number of 60 COVID patients per day. And this third section of the tool allows you now to look at specific data for each one of these numbers of COVID patients per day. So once this is established, the tool will tell you automatically, for instance, if you want to look at what would be the case for 30, uh, a demand of 30 COVID patients per day, you come to section number three, and in the first, I'll expand this a little bit. The first column, as you can see, daily cases, you look for 30, cases per day, okay? If there are 30 cases per day and you're using 30 days as a period, that means you'll, you'll be seeing 900 patients in a month, which is this calculation. Period in days, 30, it leads to 900 cases <clears throat> per month. 15% of those cases using the one um, analysis will mean that there'll be 135 patients requiring admission in uh, medium severity uh, beds. To calculate the number of, of beds required <laughs> for that for that demand in a month, we multiply the 15 days of average stay that we saw in the, in the first table by the number of cases, and that will give us a total of requirement of 2,025 bed days in that month. And uh, let me go back. If you actually click on the, on the number, and go up to the, the function level of the spreadsheet, you'll see the calculations. It tells you the box and, and the number and what, what the calculation is. So that means that for this demand of 2,025 bed days in 30 days, divided by 30 days, you'll need 68 beds to cover the, the needs. And we, are, we already established that your capacity was 70 beds. Your, 
capacity, response capacity here was established at 70 beds. So if you have a demand of 30 COVID patients per month, in general admissions, you'll, you'll be occupying 68 beds in that month, which, which leaves you within the response capacity that you have established. If we look at the, <clears throat> go back to that section. When we look at the, the need for intensive care beds now, in the 30 day, 30 case, patients per day case, right? we have 900 patients in a month. 5% that means we'll have 45 patients requiring admission in critical intensive care in that month. And if we have a total of 20 beds, it means that 900 bed days required, which divided by the 30 days in a period means that your capacity in that month would be uh, capacity, total capacity for intensive care in that month would be 30 patients. If you go back to the table, you only have 20 intensive care beds. So if you already have, if you need a capacity for 30 beds, then you're already above the response capacity for intensive care. And uh, some type of decision would have to be made to respond to that additional work overload or your intensive care would collapse. That means that you have to increase 10 beds with your ventilators and the corresponding staff to be able to deal with those 30 patients in that month. So the tool, allow, the tool allows you to do this, these estimates and look at what are your danger zones when your alarms begin to sound and uh, with adequate knowledge of the availability of resources in your, in your hospital or in your network or at the national level, allow you to now uh, make decisions as to increasing uh, number of intensive care beds, which means having more ventilators and more staff, or decreasing the number of in, increasing the number of beds available for intensive care by moving patients, non-COVID patients, to other facilities. Or uh, in many of the countries, what they're doing is, is actually uh, uh, designating one hospital to deal with COVID patients and moving all other pathologies or needs to to other hospitals or other establishments to, make, to ensure that, that at least in one place, they have full capacity to deal with the, uh, the scenarios that they have established. So the same exercise can be done using the, the, the numbers coming out of Spain and of course the extreme numbers coming out of, uh, of Italy, as you can see here. And the tool will automatically make the calculations and allow you to just uh, analyze the results based on this table and, and the breakdown that it, that it has here. I will give you the different, the different scenarios, number of beds, average um, number of bed days required for treatment of those patients in those facilities. And uh, well, from that information, it allows you to know, now look at different uh, alternative to the solutions. <clears throat> Another way of estimating uh, the, the scenarios, uh, an alternative to not using Wuhan, Spain, or Italy, is to actually look at total patients calculations on, on three different options. Option number one is the one we just saw, the three different scenarios. Option number two uses the number of uh, cases per 100,000 estimated for your country. And uh, option number three looks at a uh, population impact estimation. In this case, and the and calculations are based on 100,000, the information Information is based on 
total national population. Okay, so this is a country of 6,765,753 uh, inhabitants. Of course, we're still using the 30 day value. And we uh, look at number of cases per 100,000. This 100,000 is set in the tool. Um, we can modify it down to 10,000 or 1,000, but it, it usually um, is preset for 100,000. And it gives you now by inputting information as to you select an, uh, an estimated number of cases, and you can either use official data based on the WHO analysis of the different countries. There's a, a table available on WHO's um, uh, website, which shows you uh, the number of cases based on national population. So what, what we, we do here, uh, some countries do, is to look at countries with similar characteristics. Uh, my country has 5,000, 5 million people or, or 500,000 people. Uh, country X, Y, and Z have the same population and we have similar characteristics. So then uh, you can use the estimates from one of these countries as to the number of cases per, per day, uh, per 100,000 inhabitants. And this, so this number is, is, a, is a number that you input here. It will give you the probable number of cases in a month applied by 30 and the number of patients per day. And this number now is what is what goes into this box where we previously had the number 60. Okay. So it, that, that, that formula allows you, to, for instance, to make a national analysis instead of just the analysis for one hospital. Because one hospital might be seeing 60 patients per day, but in, at, at the national level, if you have uh, different uh, larger number of hospitals and, and different sites that are seeing patients, it's, it may be better to use population estimates rather than uh, estimates of uh, an estimate that is calculated based on your, on your current capacity. Uh, this third option is, is looking at, okay, I decide, I decide that 5% of my population uh, is going to require admission to hospitals, independently of its intensive care or, okay? And I plot that against the, the, the population and for a period of three months, which is what is the average um, behavior of the curve at this moment. The curve usually takes 90 days and going up and, and come, coming back down. So that, what this tells me is that uh, on an average, based on this uh, this percentage, I would be seeing around 67,000 uh, patients per month. Just be reminded that uh, it's not really 67,000 every month. Uh, usually the first month you'll have less and then it go growing and the second month you might have even more than 67,000 and then it starts to come down. So, but that would give you an average patient per day of 2,255 in this example, okay? So using this, this number, you go back to the scenario and uh, you can use this as the as a extreme calculation of your different scenarios. Uh, so those are, those are options. And I really personally recommend that this option, you don't try to use it until you understand and feel comfortable with the first option, which is using the three uh, examples that the three country examples, Wuhan, Italy, and, and Spain. Once uh, I, you're, you're comfortable doing that and you're comfortable working with, with, the, with the Excel spreadsheet, then of course you can attempt these calculations are, are more, uh, more extensive. And it usually works better for the national level of analysis. Okay, so the, the last two um, tabs have to, do, have to do with the number of doctors, nurses, physician nurses, and nursing assistants uh, required for the response based on the scenario that, that you finally decide to use. And we have divided those that are needed for intensive care, intensive care, critical, intensive critical care, and those required for uh, 
hospital wards that treat COVID patients, but that patients that do not require ventilatory support. So this tool now, we have using the definition uh, in your in the tool that you uh, you received before. It says something like uh, care teams, but it's not only teams because it's not only the the care unit. Uh, it's not only the, the, the human resources, but it's also the equipment, especially for critical care. It's not only the doctor, the nurse, and the assistant, but also the ventilator and whatever other uh, equipment and sundries are necessary to provide care to a COVID patient. So uh, we're gonna adjust that to uh, that definition to, to use care unit. and, and then those care units are plotted against a standard that the country has established for uh, critical care, or for intensive care. In most countries, uh, we have, a, have established that uh, an intensive care physician uh, will see so many beds, an intensive care nurse will see so many beds, and a nursing assistant will, uh, they need so many nursing assistants for, for so many beds. Since that is established already in protocols in the, in the different countries, uh, we recommend that you use a national protocol and that will allow you to then calculate the number of hours that people work uh, based on this calculation. This calculation will give you the number of hours and then you can convert that to uh, actually to people by applying the, 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 the established work um, schedule for, for different specialities. This specific uh, example is calculated for 12 hours for people working from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and that's that's example. Uh, in some uh, intensive care units in the U.S. and even he, even here in my country, Panama, uh, the schedules have been established at 12 hours because it allows for rest periods of Every 15 days, uh, the personnel gets three full days off, and between every two days of work, they get two days to rest. And uh, they're paid, for instance, when they work 12 hours, they're paid full salary for the full normal salary for the first eight hours, and the other four, they're paid at um, overtime pay, which is a double of the normal hour. So they end up uh, making more than what they would have made if they worked at the standard for 12 hours. I don't know if that, if that was clear. Because what they actually get is paid eight hours at the standard rate and then four hours double, which makes another eight hours. So they get paid for 16 hours at the standard rate instead of 12. They work two days, rest two, work two days, and then rest a weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So the, the 12 hour uh, shift for, for many hospitals uh, works well because of that, that arrangement. However, as I said before, this can be adjusted to the reality of each hospital or each country. So what the tool does is it calculates physicians for bed ratio per hour. How many beds a physician would see per, in, a, in a shift? For this case, it, it was established that each physician is responsible for 15 beds in a shift. Uh, the number of beds that are, that are in that hospital or region were 400. And the number, the number of, of teams that will be required to deal with 400 beds automatically comes, comes out in this, in this table. If you divide 400 by 50, it'll give you 27. So this, this table um, automatically does a calculation. This, this section, sorry, automatically, as you can see above, does a calculation. The same is done for nurses. In this example, uh, a nurse is assigned, nursing, yeah, nurse for, per, it's two beds per nurse. Uh, yeah, two beds per nurse, which 30 beds in a, in a and uh, you require 13 nurses to cover the 400 beds and then nursing assistants. Okay? Uh, 
the explanations are all in, in, in the different boxes and the calculations are above in the, in the, cal in the calculation section. So once this, these, you input your data here, it will give you automatically the number of care units that are required for that number of, of beds, uh, the total hours per day, total hours per month, then you input how many hours you pay or are contracted for a physician per week. Something we're not right here. It says days. It's a uh, it's usually a week. How many hours are contracted per month? Sorry, for a physician, for a nurse, a nurse assistant, and that would give you the number of people required for the the provide that service for that number of patients in one month. Remember, please, that uh, some of the issues here that, uh, that you see me struggling with is translations. Uh, I think there, there are problems with the translation still. I will uh, speak to my colleagues in Washington to adjust some of these titles because they don't seem to reflect. But this is contracting hours per month. So with this calculation, now we know the amount of, of personnel that will be required to cover or the expanded services once um, the, the number of beds for expansion and the total number of beds for the response are, are agreed on, which in this case is uh, 400, which is very high. Uh, this will work better if we looked at something closer to what was in the previous exam example, which would be 60. You see the numbers have changed automatically and also the calculation has changed. So once uh, you change the number of beds, 40, the tool will automatically change all the calculations that you need to establish here. And it does that, as I said, for intermediate care and for intensive care. So, I think that covers more or less. Uh, I go back to the first section. Each one of those sections that I've explored, you can return to by just touching the icon. Interesting. Okay. So yeah, the icons are all activated. Uh, they allow you to go to the different spreadsheets. So I'll stop here, Rufus, and uh, maybe take some of the questions. But then again, my recommendation would be to uh, I'll get this to you immediately after the session. Uh, for you to distribute it to the participants. I would recommend the participants gather the basic data, put it into the tool, and then you can, you and I can program uh, maybe 30 minute sessions with individual countries to address their questions and their concerns and their experience with the tool. I think that that will be uh, more productive and will allow us to cover more of the, um, you know, whatever questions and challenges they find. Over to you. Right, thank, thank, thank you, Ronaldo. And I, I, I agree with you. Um, I put a note in the chat already about the tool that this is the final version. So uh, you can share that with me and I will share it with all of the participants as well as um, uh, put it on the Caribbean virtual node where we're developing a site for all of the resources related to COVID. Uh, in addition to this tool, as in addition to the recording, in addition to the recording of the session. Uh, so yes, then if, you, if you hear me, I see you, Danny. I will come to you in a second, all right? Uh, so once you do that, and then I agree with you that if countries want, once countries work with the tool, they need additional training. Um, uh, working with the tool, um, they can make a, that request to me, and, I'll, and we, we'll schedule a time. Danny, let me open up your mic. Hold on one second. And we'll open up the, the session for question now. So if you could just raise your virtual hand on your video or raise the hand next to your name and i will open your mic uh when, when time we're to speak danny your mic is open speak yeah i i just wanted to to 
indicate that Dr. Rollett was here with me and okay. Dr. Anthony Harris from the QEH. Oh, great. Just so, telling me they're here because of the... <laughs> Of the, of the oh, great, 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 great. Welcome, Dr. Harrison and, and Dr. Rella. Thank you. All right. So, 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 um, so once you receive this final version of the tool, and if you you can work with the tool, you can also go back and and um, look at this uh, recording uh, if you want to look look at a particular step for guidance. And once you work with the tool, if you're satisfied and you can and you're happy, you don't have to contact us. Um, but if you need help, assistance. Um, in, in finalizing the estimations, then you can contact us and we will then uh, schedule a time for country by country uh, to address those issues and concerns that you may have. All right. Uh, so the floor is now open for questions. Any questions? You can either type in your questions or you can raise your hand and I'll open your mic for give you the floor. Ronaldo, thank you for your presentation. You with here, CPS and um... St. Lucia. Um, Rufus, um, some countries have a problem with human resource. Um, so who will be responsible for completing this template? Uh, when you when you say problems in human resource, they may not have a data clerk or uh, someone to input data. Uh, so the question is who will input the data from the doctors or the nurses? No, this is not an ongoing data. Most of the data that needs inputted, uh, data that you would derive from the various scenarios or, or the case projections, or the data okay. that the nurses themselves, like the senior nursing directors, may have information related to how they uh, schedule nurses on shifts. Some some countries nurses are scheduled on a on on, um, on an eight-hour shift. Uh, so you have three shifts of nurses per day. Some countries, as Ronaldo was talking about earlier may have just two shifts, 12 hour shift, uh, and, and they will need to know basically what manpower they have. Um, we'll need. Right, what, what manpower they have, but the, the, this, this tool also give a projection of what manpower you will need, right. uh, as well as uh, based on the beds projections that are needed based on the estimations. Um, uh, one of the things that Ronaldo also stated when he first started was that when we look, this this should be applied to countries. Now I know there are some countries that are very large that this tool was probably developed in first, um, who have many hospitals, so it's more hospital focused. But in our small territories, whereby we are working with the ministries of health, we have to look at the national level in terms of the beds available in country. And and if you and if you have um, relationship with private sector and, and the private sector have agreed that private sector hospitals will be will make beds available and you know that you know that for a fact then you can include those beds as part of your estimation as well as being a beds available for COVID. Um, as well as uh, you know many many countries are developing or have already developed uh, standalone isolation centers and those should also be uh, included as part of your bed count. Um, in, 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 in looking and dealing with this tool. Uh, yes, Denny, go ahead. I think your mic is still open or, or you can open yourself, you know. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Rufus, just before uh, Denny goes, um, in response to Mr. Ube, uh, you don't really need a, a data clerk. As if you look at the, the list there, one to six, you'll see that it's information that you, have, that you manage on a daily basis and it only needs to be inputted once. Yep. You know, once you put in this information, there's nothing else to do. It's just a matter of uh, using the different tables to do the analysis. Uh, you have the average length of stay. Uh, you have, you know, you can break that down for critical patients. Uh, you have the the number of work hours and the and whatever is the is the, um, the normative that that rules that. And you have emergency room data. So once you have that, and 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 the number of hospital beds. I'm sorry. Once you have that and put it in, uh, it doesn't require any you know, huge amount of work or uh, additional work for that data clerk or anything like that. The, the tool is very intuitive and it's, and it's usually um, very useful for those in planning, in planning units uh, to rapidly input the, the information. And as Dr. Ewing said a while ago, uh, I do think and I agree with, with Rufus that 
for smaller countries, it's better to do national estimates and not try to break down hospital by hospital if you have more than one hospital or, or two small units because it, 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 it then becomes more work. But if it, you, you do it once for the national scenario, including both public and private beds or special units that are available, et cetera, then, uh, you know, once it's done, there's no more work. Okay, Danny, Danny Gill, you, you have the mic? You have the yeah, um, I need to come back to the screen. We have, you're hearing me, right? Yes. Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Right, we got um, a forecasting supplies tool from WHO, which we filled out and we are, we've been using. Um, and I must say, in terms of what that tool provides, it provided us down to the level of the equipment, the um, the pharmaceutical and all of that you may need, the PP and everything. Right. So I I I am really confused as to, <laughs> and the and the hospital has started using it because it's given us, we were able to input our data, and it gave us a projection of what we would need in terms of of everything. So. Um, I am not, I am not sure how we're going to use this because this PAHO tool is not as detailed as that. Um, then, Danny, uh, this, I this, are you aware of what I'm talking about? It is called the, I'm, I'm, I'm quite aware. I think, I think we, uh, I think we would have, um, give notice of the availability of it to you. It's a, it's a, basically it's a equipment and supplies, um, uh, estimation tool um, and that tool focus focuses more on equipment as well as the supplies but also because of that it needs it breaks it down into um, manpower that will be needed for different areas or different functional areas of the system in response to COVID and that tool is fine and, and that is and that is that is useful um, but this one specifically is about bed managing your bed capacity. All right. Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying to you, what we have when we went through this tool, it actually looks at the type, the number of mild cases, the critical cases, and then even goes over to the test loads. How many tests you would need? How many beds you would need, and all of that? I, I think. I mean. Uh, if I may intervene there. In terms of these, uh, what? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, Ronaldo, you, you're saying them right now. These are tools. Both the WHO, ours, and um, there are other people pro um, creating tools. And in any toolbox, you use the one that is that you feel more comfortable okay. with, the one that you know better and you know the one that serves your purpose better we make them available uh it's not mandatory i, I hope that's not the impression uh power is not uh, mandating that you have to use this tool or you have to fill this out or you have to send it to us or anything like that we just we, we prepare these tools to make things uh easy for the countries but at the end of the day each country each planning unit decides which one of the tools they want to utilize and, and that's perfectly um, okay with us. And, and, and um, sometimes, Danny, when you do it, you may you may have uh, when you look at it, you may have some concurrence um, between it. But if you if you use a WHO tool, for instance, I use, I've used a WHO tool um, for in for our own internal planning purposes, based on our projections, and to help plan and support countries. And so, when we look at uh, what countries may need. Uh, we have used that tool pretending that we are the country and looking at projections and to say, okay, uh, we need to make sure these countries have X amount of supplies, X amount of this, and then we fact check it with the countries. Um, but if, if you, but you could also use this tool and see whether or not it correlates with what the other tool is saying, inputting, inputting the same data and utilizing the same scenarios, because that's another issue. Different countries use different scenarios, use different simulation. Uh, in arriving at the projected case loads or case volume, because that is a start, right? And I think there are several different models. Uh, PAHO, WHO has, uh, PAHO, PHE has put out one, uh, which we shared with countries. Uh, the UE has put out one. I think a lot of the countries are using the UE model because the UE has been working with countries and trying to 
I uh, helped them estimate their case load uh, projections. And that's um, more for the cases, yeah. We've been using that. That's more for the cases. We've been using that. So, so, so based on the cases, so when you look at the number of cases you expect, that will help then run and determine your uh, the, the various this, resources you need going forward. This is, but this is where it gets interesting because this model closely mirrors what the, blue, that, what the UE model has been indicating. But beyond all of that, I have version 1.2. Is it possible for, for in this, I talk about the WHO one, is it possible for us to get, because the, there are some fields that are not, you're not allowed to manipulate in this one, but is that is is there an updated model that we can have access to? Well, what, the WHO, the WHO, huh? We would have to go to WHO to request that. I thought that can be done. No, you're talking about the WHO version? Right. We would look at, we would look at the PAHO version because basically it will be people from the hospital looking at both of them because this is I going mean, to be. I will, I, will, I, will, I will double check the WHO version for you because I think I had 1.2 as well and see if there's another updated. If there's right. one, I'll share it with you. Because our, sure. our, as Ronaldo said, our purpose is to share with countries uh, all the tools that are available out there and for you, not to confuse you, and we don't want to do that, but for it you. It isn't confusing. It isn't confusing. It's just no, no, but, that we have no, something. So when I go to the others, I have to be able to say to them, how does this other one now add to what we now have? Okay, Judas, I will get to you. Because we're using the WHO one. Okay, good. So I will share those tools as soon as become available, and all PAHO tools will make available on the uh, on the Caribbean virtual node, which will. My God, yes, it's on. Okay, um, Judith. Um, yes. Dr. Yes. I think you just okay. answered my question. We wanted you to share, please, the WHO tool with us also. Okay. All right. Great. Thank no you. Just share that as well. I, I am having. No, I say for noting because I am having a hell of a time. With all. all right, any there are any other uh, questions? Anyone have any concerns? Questions? Please raise your hand. Uh, to indicate at the, the the hand raising button is next to your name, I think, on 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 the on the list of participants. And you can raise your hand, and I'll open your mic. Or oh, I think you have the control to open your mic as well. So I, I, I take it that this is crystal clear. Um, Benjamin, do you have any, uh, Benjamin, I'm opening your mic so you, if you want to have a word and introduce yourself and, um, and probably sure, sure. talk a little bit about the Caribbean virtual node because you, you, I think you are working to help develop that as well and let them know it's there. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yeah, I have a comment about the previous question. Uh, I, I think all these tools have different strengths. You can see that this particular one from PAHO is very important in terms of uh, calculating the expansion beds and the capacity in hospitals. So each one, and it has a component of human resources for health, of course. Uh, the supplies tool that you were talking about, uh, the WHO has another type of uh, strength. There is even nowadays the healthcare workforce estimator which goes beyond calculating the needs of uh, only doctors and nurses and nurses aides for critical care units and intensive care units. It goes even to calculate uh, other types of specialties considering that uh, the, the human resources needs for triage, for example, and primary health, uh, primary health care or first level of care units as well. So that depends on, as Reynaldo and Rufus said, that depends on the needs of the country. So. Uh, you, that, that's something to consider. The second uh, comment is about the, the section for COVID response uh, at the Caribbean node of the virtual campus of public health. We recently um, established this uh, particular section in order to put together all the information that PAHO is providing. And uh, so it basically it has links to the uh, PAHO main webpage and the list of uh, technical documents and tools that uh, are being developed by our organization. It has two basic sections. One is uh, on um, advice for general public and the other are technical documents for uh, healthcare workers. So what uh, Rufus was mentioning is that all these type of um, meetings and uh, webinars as well as technical documents are going to be 
shared and placed in this uh, section of the Caribbean notes. And uh, I take advantage to invite you to, to go and, and, and take a look at it and use the resources that are, that are there available. And that was basically my, uh, my two comments. Thank you. Okay. All right, anyone else have any question? Additional questions? Um, and, and, and anyone knows exactly how to find the Caribbean virtual node? I'm sure most persons have been there before. If you don't, I will share the link when I send the uh, updated version of the tool as well um, as the recording to know, so you know how to get there. All right, so if we don't have any um, additional questions, I would like to thank you all for uh, for participating here with us this afternoon. And I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Holder for, for um, facilitating this particular session with us. Uh, and if, if again, if you have any particular questions or concern, you can always uh, email me um, uh, for any additional questions or any additional technical cooperation related to this tool that you may have. So, uh, continue to work hard, work well, and have a restful weekend if you can. Um, thank you very much and stay safe. Okay, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon.